dear listeners, uh, at this point, a little exclaimer. This episode has been filmed in the car at 6 a.m. on the way to the airport. So the audio quality is rather shite. Let's put it that. So if um, that's been bugging you already, then maybe you should just turn off the podcast right now. If you don't mind too much, enjoy the conversation I had with Sam. The content is an absolute banger, but unfortunately the audio is not great. Yes, we know we've been working on that and we will make sure to improve that in the future. If you're still listening, have fun with our conversation and uh, see you soon. Here we are again in Sheffield still. Well, on our way to the airport. <laughs> again. Again, yeah, true. We've already been in this scenario. Last time a bit more stressed though. <laughs> I think there's, uh, at the moment, there's less water on the roads. Absolutely. The last time there was a lot. We can remember once we just passed the Snake Pass uh, just before it closed down. Right. Yeah, yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yeah, because of flooding. <laughs> so the Snake Pass Road, was, it was just about to close, wasn't it? Was it was just about to close, exactly. So, yeah, it's then, like, I can't remember what car we were in, but we're in, I think we're in the smaller <laughs> Polo. In the, in the Polo, exactly. Oh, there was God. so much water on the roads, it was literally coming up over the wheels, wasn't it? Yeah. And I mean, we left Sheffield when I still had an hour and 30 until my flight. Yeah, and we still made it, so that was, it was, that was pretty good. Uh, it was one of those missions where trains weren't working. Yeah. There was no buses. Yeah. We had to get you there, didn't we? Yeah, it's good fun. And yeah, we're here with um, Sam Whitaker. Hello. <laughs> I remember actually, uh, it's so funny, the first time I came to into the Quiff was 10 years ago in 2014. And at the Quiff questionnaire, you know, when you went into semi-finals, you had to fill out a questionnaire. I remember. <laughs> and you had to fill out your bicep size. <laughs> it was in comparison to mine. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there was peanuts and there was like small, medium, yeah. large, and then Sam Whitaker size. <laughs> and I was like, oh, who's the Sam Whitaker? I well, you know, staying with you, which is really nice back then, because we didn't know each other at all. Yeah. But um, it was uh, very evident that you had the biggest biceps around. <laughs> so of course, um, uh, Chris is jealous and he wants to know how did you get biceps this big? <laughs> well, it, it, it actually, they came from my gran. Because my, <laughs> my gran's always had massive biceps. <laughs> Just and it was no. like a, a Whitaker trait, I think. Oh. Um, and oh. even until she was in, well, I mean, she was into her 90s, uh -huh. you could still see the, the, the long head of bicep. Crazy. So, uh, yeah. Genetically, so uh, That's where it's come from. Ah. Uh, our gram. Okay. Of course, they get up, they got a bit bigger, I guess, when you started climbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I did do some, I did do loads of training when I was younger, because we didn't really train, we just climbed over it still. Mm-hmm. Um, I do remember doing some one-arm lock-offs and trying to, to basically lock off so long until it blacked out. <laughs> so that was the, the training was lock off like that on a, I, think it, I can't even remember whether it was on a fingerboard, it probably wasn't on a fingerboard, it was probably a pull up bar. Uh -huh. And just lock off until you black out. <laughs> <laughs> that's some proper English training so there. I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's where it came from. <laughs> and you started climbing when you were rather young, no? Uh, yeah, not super young. It probably wasn't even until I was 12-ish, I guess. Okay. 12 or 13. So, I, uh, yeah, I used to go out with my dad and his friends. Yeah. For nowadays standards, not super young anymore, yeah. I guess. For back then, yeah. relatively young, though. Re yeah, relatively young. Well, my dad went climbing with his mates. And he used to take me and my brother out. And we just used to, you know, hang out at the bottom of the, bottom of the crags. Uh, sometimes do a bit of top roping with him. A bit, a bit of, like, easy bouldering and soloing. Um, oh. And that's how, really, that... That's what got into it. Well, that's what you do with your dad, a bit of bouldering and soloing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, though, after, after, after a few, well, like a year or so, I was, I was into, started getting into it. I used to do solo. And he'd, uh, he'd go around, I was going around the corner, and he'd literally have to go around the corner while I was soloing roots. <laughs> really? 
Yeah, yeah. So it was a bit sketchy, but that's what, that's what we did back in the day. <laughs> so you got born into the into the sketchiness of grid climbing. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, well, I know, but you also had a, a few spicier things in your in your early years of climbing. Was, yeah. Well, that was. Uh, I think following on from climbing with my dad and his mates out on the grid, I just I, I just loved I just loved gridstone climbing. We used to obviously live in the Peak District, near the Peak District, and climbing all the local gridstone outcrops, and it just, it captured me, that's what, that by 15, 16, um, just about to leave school, it'd be my A-levels, uh, all I wanted to do was just climb, 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 and the gridstone at the time was something that I really aspired to, and I just loved climbing on grid, and, you know, lead climbing, and soloing, and a little bit bothering when it was, you know, obviously it wasn't as big as it is now. Mm-hmm. That's what we did, yeah. And the spicy roots, I was just drawn to them, I think. <laughs> just <laughs> so you also put up a few first attempts, no? Did quite a few, yeah, yeah. Been working with death and yeah, I remember the picture of you on there. Some classic ones and around the roaches area. Uh, and repeated, repeated quite a few roots. Second, you know, second ascents, third ascents, some classics. And it was just the, uh, at the time, like, they, were, they were brilliant. So that was kind of like, almost a little bit the generation after Ben Moon and Jerry Moffat. And where they start climbing when you started climbing? Yes. I mean, yeah, obviously not, Ben is still climbing, but... <laughs> yeah, not loads. It was almost, it was like Johnny Dawes mm-hmm. was doing all the stuff on, on the grid. Um, just sort of, sort of before me, or the generation before me. Yeah. Um, and some other people were doing loads of stuff, um, and there was there was just a, a real, especially in the Peak District, there was a real buzz around doing the sketchy grit, yeah. you know, and head pointing, head pointing was becoming a thing. Huh. And that was basically where you top rope the roof, and most a lot of the roofs didn't have any gear in, so you literally just get them. So you think you're ready to do them, and then you just you know solo them or lead them with minimal protection. <laughs> so and no pressure. <laughs> oh, no crash pads. I think the one came over when Seb Grieve did Path and Shaw. Um, <laughs> and that was the small Metolius map. You remember uh-huh. the tiny little one? The, the, one, the one that you still have? Uh, I've still got it. And it was, yeah, that's the one that was in hard grit. Crazy. And Seb's like, where's that Metolius map? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but was like climbing on lights or like sport climbing in general was that really a thing? There was yeah, there was a bit of sport climbing going on, definitely. Yeah, I did a little bit of it when I was younger and then I dipped out of it and went, well, that's what I was doing on the grip. You know, Steve, especially in this country, Stephen Clare was doing a lot. Yeah. Um, there was definitely a, a scene, but um, the main focus um, for me and high climbing at that time was, was definitely the sort of grist and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yes. Friends, friends, the, my friends at the time were all sight for it. We were driving around doing those, you know, doing different types of skits and reels. Yeah, because I guess Steve, what did mutation we figured out in '98, so that must have been also around. Same time. Yeah, yeah. the time yeah. when you were going think on the Yeah, I was doing still E6s, E7s, E8s, '96, '97 maybe. Okay. Must have been around. Time. Yeah. yeah, so that's very similar to when similar. Steve was doing all his uh, yeah. crazy shit on well, the floor. I think that's what he says. I think that's what he said somewhere. Uh, that a lot of people, you know, were focused on the grit, mm-hmm. and he had all these like amazing limestone roots to go out. So yeah, <laughs> he was well psyched. Yeah, I bet. And then I mean, you still went sport climbing, hard sport climbing later on. Also did Mecca. I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the uh, you'd be like me. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was. That was the end of a good sort of battle, really, because I had Arnie, who was born in 2013, and, you know, with work and life balance, looking after a baby and and everything else, it was quite difficult for me to get on, you know, to get a sort of regular routine going at Raventor. So I I remember taking him to the the crag sometimes in the car, one day with Ben Moon, actually, and him sat in the car, as a baby, get to the crag, put them to sleep in the pram, and then I'd have a couple of goes at it. So it was a, a route that I never really get got to focus on it 100%. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I had a good run at it, and then you came over. And was the boot camp. Yeah, we had, to, we had boot camp training, I remember. Um, 
and then I banked it out, did I? Yeah, it's good. It's good. It was not the best conditions, but yeah. it didn't matter, eh? We were sticky damp. Sticky damp, exactly. But earlier before, like before Arnie was born, um, I did have a spell of sport climbing at Malham. I went to Malham a lot, and I really got drawn to, to climbing up Malham. And, and you did? Yeah, unjustified, no? Yeah, Batroo unjustified. Uh -huh. and the Oak and some of the famous, famous routes there. Yeah, I remember the first time I actually came over in 2014, I only stayed for five days. But I remember that like the three days after the push, we went to Raven Tour once and then to Malam twice. Yeah, yeah. And um, it, was, it was really good. We had the cold, it was a cold day, wasn't it? It was a super day cold day. Really windy. Yeah. I did the, I did bad route that day, but just barely because it was absolutely frozen. I remember climbing rain dogs with uh, like a big puffy on. Fingers were really numb. Oh, it's horrible. And then the next day we just came back again. It was shit nice and lovely day in the sunshine. It's, uh, it's crazy. But yeah, it made me fall in love definitely with Sheffield because uh, there seemed to be like a good training scene going on. Like, that's, yeah. That was something that I have I've missed in Turkey. Like whenever I came over, you know, at any time of day, no matter which day, you could always find somebody cycle training. Like there was loads of boards. Yeah. It was yeah. like the classic motherboard at the at the climbing works. I remember it. Yeah. I think I've seen it change like <laughs> four times or something now. Um, and yeah, that was something that that didn't exist in Germany. You know, like a, a wooden a wooden board with symmetric ball holes yeah. and like wooden footholds. That was something we didn't have. I mean, that's something I then afterwards tried to replicate a little bit at the Cafe Craft. Yeah, and I imported lots of uh, beast make holes. And for my one wall, but that's actually yeah, yeah, that's actually where the idea came from. Like when I saw the motherboard, because um, so I realized it was so good for training because it was not not bad for the skin, you know. Exactly. The long-standing history of training in uh, Sheffield in the cellars, you know, it, it goes back for years. Obviously, there was the schoolroom back in the day, you know, in the school. But before that, there was uh, there was training boards in loads of different people's houses and even now not almost everybody i don't know when i when i try to think of it i mean ned has a training board in a cellar yeah. jim does yeah. dave mason does yeah. you had at some point i remember the garage yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, then you also remember the old house you had you know in the attic you had a little like beam with like some finger boards yeah. and that kind of stuff yeah and the, uh, a lot of the staff at the wall they've they've got the, the yeah. valley you know they've obviously they can get into the wall for free <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, it, you know, it's a scene. People, people will just have the, their own little setups at home. Yeah. And they can just go down into the cellar, you know, put some put some tunes on. Uh, crank out some, crank out some, uh, some moves to techno. Yeah. It's funny because, I mean, all the cellars here in Sheffield that I've seen so far, they are, you know, not any taller than, let's say, 1 meter 80. <laughs> so quite, quite tiny. Yeah, Nothing compared tiny. to like a a German, like, full height cellar, but uh, it's, uh, it's funny. <laughs> they're, uh, yeah, they're very small and sometimes they're very damp. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think, is it, is it, it's an old cellar where yes. it got the hum dehumidifier. It did there. get the dehumidifier in there and it brought, <laughs> occasionally, it brought down the humidity to below 90%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So I remember having sessions in there where the humidity was like constantly 95%. And he was saying that um, like he sometimes got it down to 85% with a dehumidifier. But he also said that on some type of holes, actually um, uh, less humidity made it yeah. worse. So. Um, it's almost like, the, like we said, Raven told that day, it was sticky down. Yeah. Especially on like on the bigger holes. Yeah, the I mean, wood, some of the wooden holes, maybe. Yeah, I mean he's only got wooden holes and <laughs> aluminium holes actually, <laughs> <laughs> and then a combination of um, wooden um, and resin, like where he like fills yeah. out wooden holes with resin. It kind of looks really nice, but most of the time you just grab wood. I think you, that's say everybody. Yeah, you know, they they take pride in it. They take pride in having the cellars, the holes, a certain way, they keep it all really clean. Mm -hmm. It's definitely um, been more of a Sheffield, it's, you know, it's definitely been a Sheffield thing. Yeah, it's a uh, prestige kind of thing almost. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it absolutely makes sense. And I feel like a lot of people try to uh, try to copy that, 
now when you when you look around there's many more well old brands that produce wooden holes because I mean the market is huge and yeah. I feel like Beast Maker couldn't even uh, satisfy the market anymore because they started with the first wooden fingerboard. Yeah. Like back then the, the Beast Maker 1000, 2000 and lots of people realized oh this is actually really nice so they started making wooden fingerboards as well but I always feel like the you know the Beast Maker board was always the the OG board fingerboard and um, same with the wooden holes. I mean, lots of people are doing it too now yeah. because it absolutely makes sense. And I think that's that's kind of cool because for me it originated in Sheffield. The same right. as, uh, yeah, same as like the climbing wall, like the, the climbing works. That's it. Uh, like, oh yeah, like 18 years ago now, wasn't it? Now, cracky. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> nearly 18 years we're having our 18th party. Crazy. In December. Um, and I think, yeah, there was, there was some other smaller boulders, there was definitely some other bouldering boards. Um, but there were, there were small, uh, there was one over Blackburn, uh, Bold UK, and that was tiny. Yeah. Um, but mainly they were lead, you know, lead top row bouldering walls. Like the Foundry? Foundry, and there was some more, yeah, Mile End Castle, Road Race, and other walls, you know, yeah. around the country. Yeah. Um, and we just, yeah, we just decided to take, you know, bouldering to a bigger, to a bigger level. Um, follow the follow the idea from font, you know, from cruising around in font following colours, mm-hmm. um, different coloured holes for a circuit, you know, everything in one big space. Uh-huh. People can go around together climbing, you know, all different types of abilities and ages and all of that. And nice coffee and good music. Yeah. And that was it. That formula. Um, that obviously been taken and expanded and. You know, it's like bouldering walls now, huge all over the world, isn't it? It's crazy. I mean, in Germany, they're yeah. popping up like mushrooms, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We've got them all over the place now, even in, you know, cities where back in the day you thought uh, one bouldering wall would be uh, completely fine. Now they're like multiple bouldering, multiple bouldering walls and rope climbing walls as well, and it's crazy. But was it well received by the community, the climbing yeah. works? Yeah, it was, uh, it went down really well. It was just, I think it was just, just the right time. It, people were ready for it. Um, there'd been, a, you know, obviously people were bouldering, but the whole competition bouldering, none of that had really sort of fully taken off. There was a few competitions around, obviously. Mm-hmm. So that was also then before Percy became an international road setter. Yeah, yeah, he was working. Percy was working at another climbing wall, and Graham was working for the BMC. Okay. Um, as a competition officer already back then okay yeah 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 back then and then um, and I was I was working for a prana rotonis uh-huh. uh, for beyond home missioning around the country and we just sort of joined forces we, all three of us came together uh-huh. um, invested sort of 50 grand each not a lot we borrowed money off a pair of three mortgaged houses and <laughs> did all you know committed to put money on credit cards the law and uh, we went for it and it was brilliant it was really well received the building was great, the atmosphere, and then we've just sort of grown from there, really. Up mini works, you know, expanded within the climbing works itself, really. Where yeah. Then, you know, the business park did the unity, the training training room. Yeah. yeah, it's good. It's still uh, it's exciting. We're always trying to strive to do new stuff, keep moving it forward a bit. Really. Yeah. And, and then you also started the quiff. The quiff, exactly. Well, that. Uh, because Graham's background was competitions as well. Percy was the reset, the re- you know, all the resetting, um, and then ended up doing the resetting of the IFSCs and all the competitions. It was the logical step for us to do a to do a one year annual climbing competition. Mm-hmm. That sort of when was that? Did we have the ten year quiff we already had? Was it last time or the one? Well, we've done one every year, but we called it something different the first couple of years. Mm-hmm. It was called the Quimbaker. <laughs> Well, that's possible. Climbing Works International Bouldering Masters <laughs> competition. <laughs> so we thought we can't keep that name, it's a bit silly. So then we uh, we changed it to Quiff. Um, but yeah, no, we've, 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 we ran one every year apart from COVID year. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2021. So there have already been more than 10 then, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it came for, I don't even know how far many it came, 2014 for sure. And then I came back in 2015 actually in one. And then 
I'm not sure if I came 2016, but 2017 I came as well and won, and then I came at least two or three more times. So yeah, it's always always it's, been good. It's a great social, isn't it? It's not just about the competition. That's you know we've always, as when you've come over, we've always had amazing times going and you know doing other 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 stuff, going climbing. You know we've just been out in Grey, we've been to Mala and Rape Tool scenes, and I think the whole Quiff vibe has hopefully over the years inspired people to come over and do a competition ball so you know see the delights yeah uh, most of the time when the weather's good uh, at the peak district and the different sessions we've had with japanese climbers and <laughs> out on grid <laughs> on grid and then you know loads of different climbers from all over the world but especially last year it was brilliant that's for me that's what the competition's about it's yeah not just the competition it's social meeting up with people again you've not seen for a while you know, the Slovenians come over and then we go to, you know, we have an after party and yeah. all, all that, you know, we've had some amazing memories of, if we can think back over the years, all the, the good stuff that we've done. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that for me is the main sort of focus with the competition. That's why I live about it. Um, that's why I always come over as well. It's, uh, sure, it's to take part in the competition, but it's mostly to spend another week in Sheffield yeah. and go climbing. <laughs> Which absolutely makes sense, and I feel like lots of people do that nowadays. I mean, now yeah. it, it has actually become a little bit of a preparation event for the for the international World Cup circuit as well. Yeah. Just because um, because of the timing, you know, mostly the bouldering World Cup start in April, and the quiff with like the middle of March is um, it's usually good it's yeah. a good timing. So usually the Japanese and some of the Slovenians come over for preparation. But yeah, it's not. Um, yeah, it's not as uh, it still doesn't feel even though there's like professional judges and like professional route setters, it still yeah. doesn't feel as serious as a as a bouldering World Cup, even though probably uh, you know the level is the same. But um, it's uh, always been always been good fun, and I guess your three qualification rounds, especially with round three, makes it that's the uh, the party round. <laughs> that's the party round. Yeah, what makes it also feel like a bit of a party. I remember actually a few years ago when I came in round three, you you don't have to dress up, but you, you were let's say strongly encouraged yeah, uh, yeah. To, to come in fancy dress, and uh, usually you always have a team of four people doing like being in one team, and there was even uh, yeah. Team Magos, and they all dressed up like I do, <laughs> like flowery shorts and flowery shirts, and they were like eating carrots all the day, all day long. It was so funny. I remember it was great. Yeah, and you also had like another sort of competition going on at some point, the Biff, I remember, for a little while. Yeah, yeah, Beastmaker International Footless Festival. Exactly. Like, so again, acronym like the uh, Quiff. <laughs> um, it, and yeah, that was again, that was another amazing competition. Um, but that was that was the other end of the, of the spectrum from Quiff in a way, because it was, obviously it was great international, we had a lot of international athletes come over for it. But the whole, pretty much the whole emphasis was fun. There was no like, there was no serious element to it. Yeah. Um, and we, the, the idea was just to think of, uh, think of as many silly, crazy, uh, fun things to do <laughs> in the competition as possible. So Percy was just come up with these amazing, different ideas <laughs> for uh, the final. You know, we've had uh, the rotating hamster wheel. Yeah. Uh, we've had the, the spit roast. <laughs> you, know, you had to just hang on, a, hang on a like an edge, a twenty mil edge. Yeah. Uh, while it rotated around, getting steeper and steeper and steeper, uh, while uh, the crowd was throwing uh, balls at you, plastic <laughs> balls. <laughs> I think maybe was that Molly, Molly and Yanya. I think to so. The final. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that. And know, did, Mo did Molly win? Molly won. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the dead hangmaster. The dead hangmaster. Yeah. Well. Um, we see now, I mean, we did our little video with Molly, so um, we see now why she won. Yeah. Like, she is an absolute beast when it comes to fingerboarding. <laughs> she is, isn't she? Yeah. And we've had, we've had like, the, the, the hanging death match final, that was the first one. We where you kind of had to kick your opponent you or something. Yeah, to kick your opponent off. <laughs> I remember that, I just remember watching it, but I only came over to the ones, but I remember the judges, like, would give you extra points this for bribing. That's it. <laughs> yeah, stickers, stickers. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, the stickers. 
or like um, the judge could just be like, oh, if you do this, bother with skipping this this hold, you'll get extra points, and it's kind of free up to the judge to <laughs> pretty much give you as many points as you wanted to. Yeah. I don't know if you remember, but I always used to wear the most ridiculous outfits possible. I remember that uh, yeah, I that year you were wearing, um, I think, the gorilla outfit. I've had a gorilla outfit. Yeah. I've had a Spider Man. Spider Man, a cat, full cat suit. <laughs> the cat suit was hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember. There's always yeah. great pictures. Oh, so good. But they were good. Yeah, they were great. Really good times. Yeah. I guess, I guess a lot of it as well is community, you know, putting points back into the community. You know, yeah. Um, putting on good shows and events for people to come and have a go. It's the same with, you know, if we keep looking forward to what we're going to do and thinking of different things we can do. We'll be another party every year and those kind of extra extracurricular yeah. uh, activities that just I just it keeps us connected to, to the scene um, and I just love doing it it's just while I've got the uh, while I've got the psych I'm yeah. gonna try and carry on as long as possible exactly I mean never short of psych are you never short of psych are you huh? try not to be yeah it's <laughs> good gotta keep going I mean you've been to a couple of the parties as well I right? have uh, yeah. It's three or four actually. Three or four, yeah. yeah, I remember uh, Jerry Moffat and Steve McFly and Ben Moon on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, one of uh, Lou's cousins almost uh, threw me over a uh, rail. Oh yeah, you got <laughs> excited, didn't you? Yeah, it's good fun. Beat you up. Yeah, I remember that. And actually, one of the parties yeah. was um, just before we did that uh, the Moonboard Masters in 2017. Uh, yeah, and like Ben was constantly concerned that we would be totally uh, hungover and like uh, super tired because, well, we stayed at the party until I think yeah. three or four, and then we had the Moonboat Masters next day. But it only started until not, not before like two p.m., so it was kind of chill. At the foundry, wasn't it? Exactly at the foundry. Uh, it's good. I remember because I came, uh, I came to have a look what was going on because it was um, it was teat. So it was tea, tea time, so 5 p.m. on Saturday. Yeah. And the party had started on Friday. And I'd been to the main works party, then we'd had an after party, and then to the pub. <laughs> and then I came to the uh, foundry to check out what was going on. <laughs> oh, good times. <laughs> See, I think you, yeah, did you, did you win? Yeah, we did. Yeah, you win. Yeah. We did. It was, it was good fun. Um, yeah, but I still feel like the climbing works. Uh, like has a good a good community and like the community aspect is still highly valued and I mean I see Ron almost yeah. every time I'm there and uh, kind of like the, the same people come in for years now people that I remember from the very beginning yeah. still training there and um, yeah always always felt welcome there which uh, is super cool you've always yeah you've always you've always been welcome there haven't you you've been able to go around behind reception and just make yourself a cup of tea yeah you know it's almost like you come in you put your coffee slippers on and you do your training and it's <laughs> it's become your like your second home for sure it? for sure there's not many climbing walls i feel so uh you know so homey <laughs> so that's good yeah and i mean i guess with uh, all the changes that Percy is doing constantly i mean he's uh, constantly changing the walls as well and um to attract people for uh, decades to come. I think, yeah, I think that's you know, for us. Maybe just keep, keep, I guess, keep moving forward and trying, you know, trying different fun things. Like you said, these person building walls. It's, it's different, isn't it? Like we were chatting the other day, weren't we, about the style in there? You know, the, the style's quite unique still nowadays. Yeah. Uh, the type of holes that we use and the setting, um, and I think with a lot of different walls around and more walls potentially you know coming down the horizon it's good to know that we've still got climbing in there and you know people like yourself can come over and still have a good session yeah no for sure and i mean yeah the style the climbing style is for sure unique but it's it's very like old school i i would consider it old school yeah. climbing style but since you haven't got that almost anywhere else anymore when we came up with chris with it such a great time because you can fall off an easy boulder so easily just because it's like shuffling around a corner or like standing on weird, a slab. Weird style, yeah. Exactly. But it's good. It's, uh, it's good fun. So we'll definitely come back again next year for the quiff.
Yeah, we'll do. So we'll um, keep fingers crossed as well that the weather's good, and yeah. we'll keep going out on some good grid tours as well. Oh yes, because that's tours. the other thing. I guess in the last few years we've done a few more grid days, haven't we? Yeah. Like back in the day, we were a bit more focused on training. Because like, train. they always came over in like deep winter. But it was fully exactly. Yeah, we couldn't we couldn't climb on the rocks, could we? Yeah. Whereas the last few years we've been really lucky, haven't we? Yeah. We've had some amazing days out in the grid. Shuffling, sure. shuffling about. Exactly. We'll have many more. Find like some nails, hard seventies and seventies. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the occasional A day if possible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's funny because we had a, just with Jim yesterday a conversation where, um, you know, if you would say anywhere in the world that you've climbed, whatever this 8A or this V11, like sweet thing, for example, let's take that as an example. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anywhere in the world, everybody would be like, well, it's just V11, what are you on about? Yeah. But in the UK, if you would say, ah, oh, like, you've tried or you've done sweet thing, everybody's like, oh, I've got that man. Well, because it's um, it's a very, uh, let's say, special style. Special. Much harder to climb V11 on gridstone than it is, let's say, in like an area like Rockland. Yeah. You can just like smash about on some crimps. Exactly, and the, you know, the conditions are generally always, you know, always perfect. Yeah. And that, I think that's one of the sort of <coughs> special special things about gridstone is sometimes, well, like a lot of the time, the conditions aren't very good because you know it's raining or you know it's misty or it's foggy. But then when when the weather is good, it's so good yeah. that you just remember. You never, you never remember the days where it's wet. You already remember the good uh, days. The good days. Yeah, the, like the crisp bluebird days. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you almost, if you have one of them, it just counteracts all the yeah. all the rain and the miserable weather. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we'll have many more of those in the future. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be. Uh, you'll be coming back. Yes, definitely. Definitely coming back for many more years to come. Yeah, you know you're always, you know you're always welcome. Thank you, thank you. Fun, fun times we have. Keep them, uh, keep them going. Maybe, yeah. If you come back for Quaif next year, yeah, for sure. Come back for Quaif with a bit more time than uh, climbing Redstone, oh, yeah. climb uh, Raven Tour again. Raven Tour if it's dry. Exactly. Yeah. No, that'll, that'll be good fun. It can be, it can be dry in March. Yeah. I think so. It's fingers, sometimes, keep fingers crossed. Yeah, February sometimes can be. Uh, February is pretty dry. No, sometimes oh. February can be dry. Okay. So all we need is like two to three weeks of good weather. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, that was yeah, awesome. <laughs> see you, um, yeah. See you, yeah. Well, I guess I'll be. See you, Quiff. Yeah, for sure. Enjoy the rest of your awesome missions thank you thank you for the drop off at the airport uh, we've made <laughs> touch wood there's uh, there's no major floods on the roads <laughs> i think i think we're good to go awesome the lots for you out there uh, if you have any uh, feedback comments anything you want to let us know feel free to write us a comment only good comments we delete shitty comments as always and um yeah we'll try to keep the uh, podcasts uh, going with special guests and uh, if you want to hear from a special guest as well, let us know uh, who it is and we'll try to make it happen at least. I mean, we're not really podcasters new at this thing, but we'll give it a go. Bye.